this is Tim Trainer, and you're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 104 of the IP Fridays podcast. I'm your co-host, Ken Suzanne. Today's guest is Mr. Timothy Trainer, the principal of both the legal consulting firm Global IP Strategy Center PC and Galaxy Systems Inc. Tim is the recognized go-to source on all matters relating to customs enforcement of intellectual property rights. His vast experience in the field supports his expansive knowledge in this subject area. Tim served as past president of the International Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition, also known as the IACC, and served on the steering committee of Interpol's Intellectual Property Crime Action Group. He has testified before congressional committees on IPR enforcement and, for the past 15 years, has co-authored the treatise Customs Enforcement of Intellectual Property Rights, published by Thomson Reuters. Before we get to today's interview, let's turn to a recent development at the United States Patent and Trademark Office you need to know. The USPTO issued a new rule for foreign trademark filers. To combat the increase of bad faith filings, the USPTO announced that as of August 3, 2019, all foreign domicile trademark applicants, registrants, and parties to trademark trial and appeal board proceedings must be represented by an attorney who is licensed to practice in the United States. The previous rule allowed only United States licensed attorneys to represent trademark applicants before the USPTO. However, in practice, many foreign attorneys assisted applicants. This was allowed under the old rules as long as filings were signed by the applicant and represented themselves pro se. Under the new foreign domicile rule, All trademark applicants, registrants, and parties with permanent legal residence or principal place of business outside the U.S. will be required to have a U.S. licensed attorney represent them in all USPTO trademark matters. Attorneys are now required to provide proof of good standing from their barred state, date of bar admission, and bar license number. For those who submit an application without an attorney, the USPTO will still examine the application in its, quote, usual course, close quote, but will require the foreign applicant to include a U.S. licensed attorney in good standing to be entered on the record. According to Mary Boney Dennison, Commissioner of Trademarks at the USPTO, this action is a step forward in the fight against fraudulent trademark submissions. These submissions include, open quote, knowingly false claims, fake or altered specimens, inaccurate addresses and ownership, and practitioners who aren't authorized to represent others before the USPTO, close quote. The new rule is now in effect and applies to all new applications, responses to office actions, and post-registration maintenance filings. Now, on to today's interview with Timothy Trainer. Our guest today on IP Fridays is Timothy Trainer. Mr. Trainer is the principal at his legal consulting firm, Global IP Strategy Center PC, and is also the principal at Galaxy Systems Inc., where he offers an online interactive IP tutorial that has been licensed by U.S. government agencies. Mr. Trainer's IP experience began at the U.S. Customs Service as one of the three original members of the IPR branch. He has also worked at the USPTO's Office of Legislative and International Affairs. In the private sector, he was an associate at a D.C. firm and president of the International Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition. During his time as president of the IACC, Mr. Trainer was on the steering committee of Interpol's Intellectual Property Crime Action Group and chaired the, UN, the UN's Economic Commission for Europe's IPR Working Group. 
He has testified before several congressional committees on the issue of IPR enforcement. For several years, he was an adjunct professor at American University's Washington College of Law. Currently, he is a cleared advisor and member of the Intellectual Property Industry Trade Advisory Committee to the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. For the past 15 years, he has co-authored the treatise Customs Enforcement of Intellectual Property Rights, and in May 2015, the book Potato Chips to Computer Chips, The War on Fake Stuff, Shortchanging IPR's Benefits to Economic Growth and Development, was published. Welcome, Tim, to IP Fridays. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. Tim, let's jump right in and talk about the question of why is customs involved in IPR? Well, I, I think that one of the priorities that uh, was identified back in the 80s uh, when the U.S. and Japan, uh, when we were having our trade friction with them at that time, uh, the leadership at Customs uh, decided that protection of intellectual property would be an important uh, task for Customs to take on, especially as to the importation of goods that may infringe U.S.-owned intellectual property rights uh, because of the trade uh, um, imbalance that existed at that time. Mm -hmm. So th that was one of the probably driving forces back then. Uh, from a timing perspective, it was also the same period of time when uh, the U.S. Congress was looking at legislation uh, basically for the same reason, finding ways to try and facilitate or assist U.S. Uh, commerce uh, and companies abroad, and thereby also looking at tool, legislative tools to protect uh, U.S. industry from intellectual property theft. Mm -hmm. Now, in the United States, what are the primary agencies uh, responsible for IPR border enforcement? Well, certainly at the border, it would be today, it's U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which is under the uh, new, new, to me, new Department of Homeland Security. Uh, for those who may not be aware, the U.S. Customs Service uh, transitioned to what is now the U.S. Customs and Border Protection after uh, the September 11, 2001 attacks. Uh, there was a major reorganization of government agencies, so Customs was moved from the Department of Treasury to the new Department of, uh, of Homeland Security. So we had this U.S. CBP, Customs Border Protection, and also uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, the, you, the uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, or otherwise referred to as ICE, would be those guys that uh, conduct uh, criminal investigations. Uh, and back in the day, that was simply just another office within the custom, U.S. Customs Service. So uh, these days, they're split. You have the more administrative, traditional work of customs under CBP, and then you also have the criminal investigative arm under ICE. Uh, those are the two primary because both of those uh, sub-agencies are part of Homeland Security. Uh, so between the administrative and criminal uh, investigative uh, services of ICE, uh, you really have the two major components of what was at one time U.S. Customs, uh, and they are primarily responsible for goods that cross the border. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about practical implementation. How does an IPI... IPR owner today or their counsel engage these U.S. agencies uh, to obtain their assistance, and what exactly can they do for them? Well, from the perspective of a copyright or trademark owner, uh, both uh, the laws uh, in the Customs uh, 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 Title 19 and also Title 17 uh, for copyrights and Title 15 for trademarks, they're pretty clear that Copyright and trademark owners can actually record their intellectual property, their copyright or trademark, directly into the customs database, mm -hmm. uh, which takes only a few moments. You can actually uh, take your existing U.S. trademark registration or copyright registration and then go right online and record them and get them into the uh, customs database, which is the first thing you do. It's the simplest thing to do to put that information into the customs database. That would be the first thing, and, and by having that in the database, uh, it allows customs officers nationwide that have access to these networks to see the information, the, the basic information about a trademark or copyright that the owners would like to be, have protected at the border. 
uh, against the possibility of infringing goods crossing the border. But I would also add that for it, for that recordation with customs to truly be effective, uh, the IP owner should really uh, have a training program to go out and meet face-to-face with the uh, field customs uh, officials who are out there, really the ones that look at the cargo, uh, train them, educate them as to what it is they really should be looking for that uh, distinguishes a legitimate good against that uh, of an infringing good. Because at the end of, uh, end of the day, they, they need to touch, feel uh, what these things are that what they should be looking for. And the only people who really know the ins and outs of a particular product are are the representatives or the or the corporate representatives that uh, are the company that owns the uh, intellectual property asset. That's a good point. Now, is this training done monthly or yearly? What's what's the typical schedule? Well, it's really up to the intellectual property owner. The copyright trademark owners have to decide, uh, you know, how they want to structure a training prog- program. Customs is fairly open to training, uh, either directly from a company or if a company belongs to a trade association and uh, if the uh, trademark or copyright owner wants to work with a trade association having a program or on its own, that's up to them. But ultimately, it's really simply reaching out to the customs ports of entry uh, and, and arranging the, tra- the training program. Uh, you, sh- you know, the, the trademark and copyright owners ought to be aware that, that there are well over 300 official ports of entry in the United States. Wow. And so you really have to think strategically about what is your product, how is it most likely entering the United States, and more importantly, how do you most likely think a, a, an infringer is trying to get your goods, you know, their goods into the country. Uh, and so th- there has to be some thought given to where do you think the infringing goods are being made, how do you think they're being transported, uh, and then what are the most likely ports that where these infringing goods will be seen? Uh, so all those kinds of considerations have to be looked at and weighed before you reach out to a port because clearly no one's going to be able to go to all 300 ports of entry. Uh, you have to be pretty selective. That's right. Let's talk about recent developments in the law. Can you update our listeners on some of the highlights? Sure. I think the the most important thing uh, was the uh, Trade Facilitation Trade Enforcement Act of 2015. It it actually uh, expanded customs authority as far as protection uh, for a lot of copyright owners, perhaps. uh, It it uh, basically statutorily expands customs authority to protect against the importation of uh, what they call circumvention devices, uh, things made to try and uh, circumvent protection of copyright. Uh, so that, that's one area to look at in the, in the law. Another provision was to allow copyright owners whose uh, application to register the copyrights are pending to also be able to get uh, protection. Uh, those were two really big things. Now, what has complicated, in my view, that the latter, uh, the, the protection of uh, copyrights that are simply pending at the copyright office may have just become a little bit more complicated because of a very recent uh, Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court said that you could not uh, initiate an infringement suit unless your application has actually uh, been acted upon. So a pending application would not be sufficient for uh, filing suit for infringement uh, in the courts of the United States. So I don't know uh, how that would impact the way customs actually acts on a on a pending uh, copyright uh, application, mm-hmm. uh, I've made that query. I'm still waiting for an answer, so uh, we'll, we'll have to just wait and see. We'll definitely have to wait and see. Now let's look at the global picture. How does the U.S. affect how other countries protect IPR at the border? Can you comment on any of those points? Sure. We, as you probably know, we we certainly have a, a fair number of what we call free trade agreements with a number of trading partners, South Korea being one more recent one. Then we also have a free trade agreement with uh, the Central American countries, uh, Chile, Peru. I could go, there's, there's a whole list. Uh, but in each of these free trade agreements, there is an intellectual property chapter. Uh, mm-hmm. And then within that particular chapter, 
there's a section on border measures specific to uh, border enforcement of intellectual property. And what the U.S. has done is in each of these uh, agreements, we have basically obligated our trading partners to uh, heighten their level of enforcement at the border against counterfeit pirate goods. Uh, just to give you an example, the the global standard is pretty low. The only obligation a country has if they are a member of the World Trade Organization is simply to have enforcement measures against the infringing imports. Our trade agreements require our trading partners to also provide enforcement against goods that may be transiting their country or uh, an attempt to export counterfeit pirate goods. So we've heightened that. The other thing we've done is said you have to give your uh, competent authorities, as, as we mentioned, that's the way it's termed in the agreement, uh, you have to give them the legal power to take enforcement measures even if there's been no application by a trademark or copyright owner. In other words, if a customs officer suspects an attempt to import, export uh, infringing goods uh, based on their own information or knowledge that they may have, they should still be able to act even if uh, the trademark copyright has not been recorded with their respective uh, enforcement agency. Mm-hmm. So we, we have actually uh, made our trading partners obligate themselves to m- a much higher standard of enforcement than the international agreements would require. Um, turning our attention to your book, which I know has been a very popular uh, read for many, and you've recently updated your book, which is entitled Customs Enforcement of Intellectual Property Rights, published by Thomson Reuters. Can you update us on some of the highlights if one was to buy that book? Well, what we do is we try to highlight these kinds of uh, uh, developments, such as what's happened, for example, what if the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement actually uh, goes into effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what would be the changes? And, and, and so, as I just pointed out, we're, we're basically saying to Canada and Mexico, uh, this agreement will require your customs authorities to have these uh, increased levels of uh, enforcement powers. So at the moment, they don't have that. And if the agreements are ratified by the three countries and, and goes into force, then all, you know, all of our trading partners, all the parties to this particular agreement would have to do that. The other thing that's really interesting, uh, and I, we include uh, the text here in this year's uh, edition, is that the comprehensive and progressive trade uh, trans-Pacific partnership agreement, which we used to be part of as the TPP, mm-hmm. uh, it, is go- it has gone forward without us, but what they actually tended to do was retain uh, some of the stronger elements of border enforcement that we had actually negotiated while we were still part of it. Uh, so that has remained in force. And now that that particular agreement has gone into effect with the other uh, 11 countries uh, without us, uh, that language is actually stronger than the international standard as well. So uh, despite our withdrawal, uh, that too has been an agreement that we had a, a significant influence on. And uh from our perspective, it's a step forward, especially when you look at the fact that that's a that's an agreement with 11 countries. So we had an we we had significant influence on trading partners uh, before we withdrew from that agreement. So I would suggest that to any of your listeners that if they have clients, intellectual property owners uh, that that are operating in the countries that are members of the, uh, the party to the CPTPP, uh, they should actually take a look at that that language as well, because it it may be beneficial to them with regard to the enforcement of intellectual property. Good point, Tim. Tim, do you predict that IP seizure statistics will rise in the coming years? Oh, absolutely. Uh, We we actually have a table in in the uh, book, uh, and we look at the last, I don't know how many years of statistics we have. Now, Having said that, what there is one interesting trend. Uh, for example, the European Union's statistics that their numbers of seizures it's fluctuated a little bit up and down, and part of that is because of the increased challenge due to uh, what's happened with the internet. 
they're having major challenges because these days, um, as consumers, we are now ordering things online directly, which means that you have many, many more uh, shipments of goods coming from abroad, either coming through express mail, mail courier hubs or through the international postal system, and you're getting smaller packages, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so this has is, this is really increased the challenge of not just the customs authorities, but your your inspectors at the mail facilities and, and things like that. So we still have a massive number, uh, increased number of seizures because of that. But unfortunately, that may mean, though, that the actual volume of goods seized may be much lower, be, even though you have a higher number of actual shipments or packages seized, right? Sure. Uh, so the, the the internet has certainly changed the dynamic from that perspective, uh, and so the the number of seizures in certain countries now in the U.S. it's certainly continued to go up every year, uh, but we're no no longer seeing the kinds of massive uh, numbers of containers seized like we may have early on during this uh, uh, focused enforcement on uh, for for counterfeit pirate goods. I mean, I can tell you from my experience at the in the U.S. Customs Service that counterfeiters uh, also can identify trends. They can identify enforcement trends, so they will adapt. Uh, you know what? What we saw at one point was you could have you could have seen a container that held maybe a hundred thousand units. Well, when they realize that you're targeting and, and getting those shipments out of their illegal stream of commerce, they break down their shipments instead of one shipment of a hundred thousand units. They may break, break it down into ten shipments of ten thousand, so that some of it will get through. Interesting. So we have to constantly think about. If we change the way we go about trying to detect infringing goods, how will they change the way they try to get their de- infringing goods through to the customer, the ultimate customer? Yes. So it's constantly a, a, a battle to try and figure that out. We're going to be wrapping up shortly, Tim. Just another two more questions. What should companies be doing today if they're not already doing so with respect to IPR border enforcement? Well, there, there are a couple of things. Obviously, one Look at what products, uh, which which trademarks, which copyrights are most important to your company, and are you not simply depositing the information with customs, but are you developing a training program that's a sustained program, an ongoing program uh, of enforcement with customs, both here in the United States and anywhere else where you you are doing a fair volume of business, because uh, it's a country by country effort. Uh, but at the same time, if you invest in that program, it will have a reward because the better that customs can identify, recognize uh, goods that are, are similar to yours, the more likely they are to stay stay on top of that. And, and really what you're doing is building this dialogue with customs, uh, familiarity with the product, familiarity with the intellectual property, so that you are getting the kinds of results uh, that, that hopefully you're – you are looking to get from customs, but it does require a sustained program. Mm-hmm. Tim, how can our listeners find you after listening to this podcast? Uh, well, just uh, I think if you just put my name in, Timothy Trainer, uh, you'll find me on the internet, um, and I think that's probably the easiest way. And that's T R A I N E R, so it's the simplest way to spell it, I think. Exactly. Tim, thanks so much for joining us today on IP Fridays. Thank you, Ken. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at IPFridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at IPFridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to IPFridays.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, 
please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.